Hi, I'm Joshua Farnsworth and welcome back to my woodworking school. In part two of my guide on layout marking and measuring tools, I'll be talking about marking gauges, mortise gauges, marking knives, straight edges, winding sticks, and more tools that you'll need for woodworking. As I mentioned in part one, of, this video goes along with my article on choosing layout, marking, measuring tools. In the notes section below this video, you'll find a link to the guide and all my other tool buying guide articles. My tool guides have a lot more detail than I have time to share in these videos. And also in my guides, I mentioned specific brand names and models of tools that I prefer here in my school, which I typically don't like to mention uh, in these videos because tool quality can change over time and my opinion about those brands can also change. I'll also be releasing videos for all my other guides on buying hand tools and power tools. So if you subscribe to my YouTube channel below this video, you'll be notified immediately when those videos are released. All right, let's get started. Marking gauges are tools that are used to scribe accurate reference lines when laying out uh, your furniture joints. And these are tools that you definitely want to get right since they're so important in helping your joints fit together tightly. There are just so many bad marking gauges on the market. So I'd like to help you understand which marking gauges are the best value and which types to avoid. Marking gauges come in a few different styles. Some, like this one, have single nail-like pins. This type of marking gauge does have its uses in certain situations, uh, like when you have strong grain, and it's usually the cheapest to buy and easiest to make. But on most joint layouts, it doesn't give you a very crisp line. You want a knife line when you'll be using a chisel to cut along the line. A pin will give a fuzzy V-shaped line, especially when cutting across the grain. That's where cutting gauges come in. They're also called slicing gauges. Traditional wooden, wooden cutting gauges, like this one, have a cutter that actually slices a crisp and accurate line, especially across the grain. But if you've already got a wooden pin marking gauge, don't worry, don't throw it away. <laughs> There's a method for using a file to modify the pin into a slicing cutter, which I showed in my video on rehabbing marking and mortise gauges. I'll share a link to that video in the notes below this video. Antique marking gauges, like this one with a brass fence and exotic wood, can work amazingly and are quite lovely. But they can also be quite collectible, which takes them out of a lot of people's price range. My personal preference for marking gauges is a wheel-style cutting gauge. The cutter is a round, disc-shaped blade that gives a very nice, crisp line. These were made uh, as far back as in the 1800s, but there are a lot of new wheel cutting gauges on the market that are really great. But I need to warn you that I have tried some of the really inexpensive wheel cutting gauges, and many of them are very poorly made. And on the higher end, wheel cutting gauges can get up around $100, and that's before you buy add-ons. They can jump up to around $250 with all the little add-ons. Uh, I have used that particular marking gauge that I'm referring to, and it really is nice, but another manufacturer has made a very similar wheel cutting gauge, and it sells for around $30 to $35. I bought one of them, and I loved it so much that I bought a couple more for my school, and my students love them so much that now I have these gauges for all of my students. I'll share a link to this marking gauge along with all other tools I mentioned here, uh, and I'll share it in my article. I really prefer this style of wheel cutting gauge because it has an adjustable barrel that moves the cutter up and down. Uh, but more importantly, I love it because it uses two thumb screws to keep the bar from moving. At one time, I had enjoyed using this wheel cutting gauge made by a prominent tool maker. It runs about $40 plus shipping. But over time, I discovered that no matter how tight I screwed it down, the shaft would still slip unless I was very careful. The same tool seller also has a relatively inexpensive tiny version of this marking gauge, 
which moves even worse. It runs about $25 plus shipping. And I've also found that the fence is just too small to be very effective. So I would avoid something like that. Now that we've discussed marking gauges, let's move on to a very similar gauge called a mortise gauge. In fact, uh, some gauges double as both a marking gauge and a mortise gauge. Mortise gauges have two pins or two cutters instead of just one. Why? Well, it's to lay out the shoulders of mortises, like for this table leg mortise and tenon joint. Now let me tell you up front that if you're on a tight budget, you can most certainly get along with just a marking gauge and you don't have to buy a mortising gauge. It is a lot less convenient to mark half of the lines on all the parts first and then go back and change it and set the marking gauge for the other wall of the mortise. But it can be done and I've done it quite a bit. I just don't want you to feel like you have to go out and buy every single hand tool before you can start making furniture. But a dedicated mortise gauge does save time and it makes it a little easier to prevent making a mistake. The options for mortise gauges are just about the same as with marking gauges, so I won't cover all that again. But there are a couple important points I want to mention. Antique mortise gauges like this are my favorite because they tightly hold the measurement that I take from my mortise chisel. You can see how firmly it holds. But if you're buying antique wooden marking gauges or mortise gauges, just make sure that the gauge is sturdy when tightened down and that the wooden or metal screws aren't broken. If the mortise gauge doesn't have cutters, but pins like this one, that's okay. Because just like I mentioned with the marking gauges, you can also use a file to convert the pins into cutters. I've had really good luck with these antique mustache style mortise gauges, and they really are pretty affordable at about $20 to $30 in good condition. Aside from the nice rosewood and brass, they double as a marking gauge on one end and a mortise gauge on the other end. They come with pins, but I converted most of mine to the cutters quite easily. I'll share the model number of this and a couple other good ones in my article. This wheeled mortise gauge is made by the same company that makes the wheel marking gauge that I mentioned a little earlier. It can be used as a mortise gauge or it can hold two separate measurements simultaneously if you're just using it as a marking gauge, which is pretty convenient. This is uh, important for when you're repeating multiple measurements on multiple furniture parts. This is an appealing gauge for someone just wanting to purchase one gauge rather than a separate marking gauge and a mortising gauge. However, it does still slip, but not as much as their normal marking gauge. If it weren't for the slipping issue and one other issue, this, in my opinion, would be the absolute best mortise gauge ever made. Here's the other problem. When I use an antique style mortise gauge like this wooden one, I can easily move the fence while keeping the cutters from moving because the independent pin is advanced by a screw mechanism. You would do this when you move from marking your mortises to marking the tenons, and you absolutely want the cutters to not move, but you have to move the fence. But as you can see on this wheeled mortise gauge, it's very difficult to keep the cutters in place when you move the fence. Yes, the company that makes them later released a shaft clamp to solve this problem, but they charge an extra $11 for it if you just need the clamp like I, like I do. In my opinion, it should certainly be a feature that's included, especially for a part that likely costs under 50 cents to make. The gauge costs about $55 plus shipping without the clamp and an extra $7 if you want it to come with the clamp. If you don't mind paying a little extra for the shaft clamp, and if you're careful to keep the shafts from slipping, then this mortise gauge is a really fine option. And it can certainly double as a normal marking gauge, as I mentioned, so you wouldn't have to buy both. And that leads me to a modern style of mortise gauge that I would strongly caution against buying due to a similar issue as the previous gauge. This style is very common among cheap new tool sellers. The gauge looks really pretty, 
But as you can see here, when you loosen the thumb screw to adjust the fence, it is very, very difficult to keep the pins from moving. And then you'll lose your measurement. So I wouldn't recommend that you buy one. But if you've already purchased one of these, again, don't throw it in the trash. It is inconvenient, but you can grab a quick grip clamp or something like this and tighten the sliding bar in place before you loosen the thumb screw. But it sure is inconvenient and awkward. And I guess you could also use some painter's tape or something like that to hold it in place too. A panel gauge is like a very large marking gauge, and it's used for sizing your board's width to show where to rip the board if your marking gauge isn't long enough. Not many companies make these gauges new, uh, but they can be found on the antique market. I've purchased quite a few panel gauges for my personal use and for my school, and most are a bit wobbly, I'll be honest. However, I've found that not to really be a huge problem if you hold the gauge fence uh, steady when you're using it. You can sharpen and rehab these panel gauges the same way I showed in the above video on marking gauges and mortising gauges. I would categorize panel gauges as a nice to have tool, but not a necessary one. You can certainly achieve similar results by measuring the distance of your rip cut at each end of the board and then strike a line between those two marks with a straight edge for a shorter board or a chalk line for a longer board. And if your board is narrow enough, a 12 inch combination square also works great for marking the width of the board. A marking knife, also called a striking knife, is used to make very precise layout lines for your joints, especially where you'll be chopping or paring with a chisel. The chisel sits right in the knife line and that's how you get accurate cuts. So you wanna buy a knife that keeps a sharp edge you also want a marking knife that will let you get into tight spaces, especially when trying to lay out the tails onto the pin board when you're making a dovetail joint. Like most tools, marking knives come in different styles. Uh, some marking knives have a flat face with a double bevel face on the other side. That's nice if you want to keep the flat face against the walls of the joint. This style of marking knife can run anywhere from $5 all the way up to $300. I'd stay away from the price extremes. On the upper end, why pay so much money for something that you don't need to, unless you have a lot of extra cash? And on the lower end, I've tested a bunch of the sub $10 marking knives, like these knives, so I could try to find a good option to recommend to students, but all the ones that my students and I tried were terrible. I discovered that the metal isn't even hardened. So even after giving them a good sharpening, the edges bend over within a couple minutes. I've shared a list of these bad marking knives in my article so you can steer clear of them. I have found a couple nice marking knives, both, both under $25 that I can recommend after much testing. This knife is especially my favorite and is used a lot in my school. It's not as pretty as an expensive marking knife, but the blade is very thin and it holds an edge really well. This one is a few dollars more, but it has a nice look to it. Although it's not quite as thin as the black marking knife. I sometimes also use a simple chip carving knife or even a pocket knife to lay out my joints. If you go this route, just, you just need to make sure to tip the blade to the side slightly so that the edge of the blade gets right against the square's edge or against the tail of the dovetail joint that you're laying out. A straight edge has many uses, including testing the faces and edges of your boards for flatness when squaring them up with hand tools. You can see how to do this uh, in my video on squaring lumber with hand tools that I made quite a few years ago. I'll share a link in the notes below this video. I also use a straight edge a lot for when I'm calibrating my machinery, especially uh, the beds of my power jointer and my thickness planer. Straight edges can be made in your shop out of wood, or they can be purchased from a store. The commercial straight edges are typically metal. I love both styles and I use both metal and wooden straight edges here in my school. Both styles have pros and cons. 
Wooden straight edges are cheap to make, especially if you already have some stable quarter sawn hardwood lumber to make them out of. Uh, for those of you who don't know what quarter sawn means, quarter sawn boards are characterized by vertical grain, as you can see here. It's just how you cut the wood. Wooden straight edges are also easy to repair if you drop on the floor or if the wood moves over time. You just run a jointer plane over the edge or run the straight edge across your power jointer. The downside of a wooden straight edge is that the wood does move over time and you need something to test its flatness on. The cast iron table of a table saw or a power jointer are good surfaces to test them on. The pros of metal straight edges is that they don't have to be trued up and you can count on them for always staying flat because the good ones are precision ground to a tight tolerance. That is, unless you drop them. That's the con. You can ruin a metal straight edge, but I'm always really careful, so I've never dropped a metal straight edge yet. Knock on wood. Good metal straight edges can run anywhere from $20 for a good aluminum straight edge all the way up to a couple hundred dollars for something like a steel straight edge. I've had excellent luck with a couple brands of aluminum straight edges, which you of course can find in my article. My personal preference is to have a straight edge that's around three feet long. That's kind of the sweet spot for me when I'm hand planing boards. A while ago I made a video on making a wooden straight edge, so you can watch that video if you want to go the route of a wooden straight edge. Again, the link to that video will be included in the notes below this video. Winding sticks are used to help you test a board for wind or twisting. You set these sticks at the opposite ends of a board, parallel to each other, and you crouch down and you sight down the board to see which two corners are higher than the other two. The winding sticks magnify the twisting in the board so you can see the twisting better. Then I use a hand plane to bring down the high corners of the board. I'd recommend that you don't buy winding sticks. You can and should make your own winding sticks. It's a perfect beginner's project when you're getting into woodworking with hand tools. And contrary to popular belief, winding sticks don't need to be fancy. Just like a straight edge, you can use a simple straight piece of quarter sawn scrap hardwood and inlay some contrasting wood. And if you're intimidated by inlaying wood, then you can bore holes and just add dowels, like I did on these winding sticks. And I've even heard of woodworkers buying angled aluminum from the hardware store and spray painting the ends for visibility. It's not pretty, but it'll do the job. But if you want to make some pretty winding sticks, you can watch the video that I made on making winding sticks. Again, you can find the link to that video in the notes below this video. A folding rule is a tool that's used for taking measurements on your wood, and it folds up nicely to be stored in your back pocket. Folding rules are used for somewhat precise measuring. You can find vintage folding rules for really cheap, but beware not all folding rules are created equal, like a lot of other tools. You can either buy a nice flat folding rule like this one, or a zigzag style folding rule like this one. The zigzag folding rules are usually not collectible and are thus much cheaper. They also extend longer and can be found new as well. But the vintage rules are higher quality and they look great. Here's what to look for when buying a good folding rule. First, make sure the numbers and lines aren't worn off. Second, make sure the metal joints are in good shape and aren't wobbling. You can try applying a little oil in the joint to see if that helps. Third, check to make sure one of the ends isn't broken off. This is quite common on the zigzag rules, especially after my kids have gotten a hold of them. I'm not joking, they've broken at least two of mine. Fourth, if you're looking to get a nice vintage folding rule, look for one that has a boxwood body, a rounded brass top, and brass edges. In my article, I've shared a couple of my favorite vintage models that won't break the bank. If you don't own a folding rule, I want you to realize that you can certainly use a tape measure. 
I use a tape measure mostly for when I need to make rough measurements or for when I go to the lumber yard because the folding rules aren't long enough for a long piece of wood. But in my opinion, it's easier to get measuring errors when using tape measures, especially if you don't know why the metal hook on the end of the tape measure wobbles. If you know why it wobbles, uh, leave a comment below so everyone will know how cool you are. If you don't, then read the comments below from those people who left the comments. I like to have a shorter 12 foot tape measure for most woodworking applications because I rarely measure lumber over that length. But when I'm doing carpentry work, for example, I like a tape measure that extends over 25 feet or something. You really don't need to buy two tape measures though, just use what you've got or what you can find. I mentioned some other marking, measuring, and layout tools in my article, but I didn't find them urgent enough to mention them in this video and have the video go even longer than it already has. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed this video and that it's been helpful to you. And as always, if you have any questions, be sure to ask them below in the comments section and I'll, I'll try to answer them. And while you're down there, why not give this video a thumbs up? It only takes a second and it really helps me out. And make sure to subscribe to my channel because in my next video, I'll be talking about what you should know uh, before you buy hand planes. That's our most popular hand tool buyer's guide, so I'm sure you won't want to miss that video. Thanks for hanging out here in my shop. Hope to see you next time. Hi, I'm Joshua Farnsworth. If you like this video, I've got a whole bunch of other free woodworking videos and articles at my website, which you can visit by clicking right here. You'll go to woodandshop.com. Down here, if you click, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. And over here are some uh, really great other videos that I think you might like to check out.